persistent and deliberate human and indigenous rights violations and abuses are the root causes behind Canada's staggering rates of violence against indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited people, as stated in the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. The numbers really are staggering. Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited individuals are 12 times more likely to experience violence and seven times more likely to be murdered. Chief Commissioner Marion Buller says the testimony at the inquiry was gut-wrenching. It was difficult to hear the stories of survivors. However, she says those stories needed to be told. They needed to be heard and they needed to be recorded. The final report contains the truths of more than 2,300 family members, survivors, experts, and traditional knowledge keepers that were shared over the two-year mandate of the inquiry. There are 231 calls for justice in the final report. Calls for justice that are directed at all of us, all Canadians, and at every level of government from First Nations through to the federal government calls for justice that some feel will go unheard. But Commissioner Buller disagrees. She says the act of acknowledging and recording the truths of victims' families, survivors, and others raises awareness, and that the very nature of that process instigates change. Change that she admits takes time, but change that has already begun. One of the lessons she says she learned working in the justice system is that real change has to happen at the grassroots. I invited Chief Commissioner Marion Buller to join me for a conversation that matters about the path forward in reducing harm and violence directed at Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited people. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. Marion Buller, uh, retired Justice Marion Buller, uh, Chief Commissioner of the Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls and Two-Spirited People. Uh, before we start, Please let us acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish First Nations. You were the chief commissioner of this very, very important inquiry into what has happened to so many Indigenous females and two-spirited people. Do you think that we're uh, paying attention um, now that you've issued the final report? Um, and I say that because I worry that, you know, are we paying attention to the final report from uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? And, and it's something that I really, really believe that we have to pay very close attention to because it's about the future of our country. And I say ours because it is a collective moving forward. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for acknowledging the First People of this territory and I'm grateful to them as well for allowing me to be a guest on their beautiful territory and mm -hmm. it, oh, it is beautiful. About the two reports, uh, good question. I think uh, we have to look at it as a continuum. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission report was uh, a continuation of what started a really long time ago with the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Mm -hmm. I see our report, the report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, as being a continuation of that report. And those reports, all the ones that went before it, they laid the foundation for the work that we were able to do. Mm -hmm. Are we ignoring it? What's happening? Um, I think we have to put it in historical context. Uh, today, or yesterday, I think it was, the government announced uh, two residential schools will be turned into museums. That's in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report that mm -hmm. came out, calls for justice that came out, I, if I, my math is correct, about eight years ago. Uh, I'm not expecting a quick response to our report because it takes a while, first of all, to 
wade through the thousand odd pages of our report, but it also takes a while to di process it, digest it, and understand what to do next. So it's happening. It's not a fast process, nor should it be. Mm -hmm. My concern is that it won't be addressed uh, fully or that people will go, there, there's the report, we've done what we need to, now let's move on. You know, I had a conversation with Senator Murray Sinclair and he said, you know, we are not going to have true reconciliation in this country until uh, we see the, the, the disappearance of this line of one group of people who say, my rights are inherent and yours are granted. Mm -hmm. uh, that everybody has to have access to the same rights. And in Canada, we still don't have that. And at the very end of that continuum are women, Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited people who take the brunt of all that society has to throw at them, and they have virtually no resources to, to fight back. You know, um, Senator Sinclair put it really well which he always does anyway, yes. <laughs> uh, that in, before reconciliation, we have to have truth. Yes. And we unearthed some very unpopular, very disturbing truths in the process of our work. Mm -hmm. And it takes a while to understand that and digest it. As I've said, uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I didn't know about the forced relocations of Inuit people as recently as 25 years ago. I didn't know about the dog sled uh, tragedy where dogs were just simply shot in communities. Uh, we all have to learn the true history of Canada before we can really move forward. And it's happening, slowly, but it's happening because it's an ugly truth. It is an ugly truth, and many people don't want to believe that in a country where we think of ourselves as being a just society, that things of this uh, horrific nature can happen. I remember former Prime Minister uh, Paul Martin, after he had stepped down and he was still trying to move forward with the Kelowna Accord, was asked, why? Like, why are you doing this? And he said, well, you know, as Canadians, we like to think that we're uh, kind-hearted and generous people, and we'll do things to help uh, a village in Rwanda or somewhere else. But we have this ability to turn a blind eye on the very, very real and tragic circumstances that exist here in Canada on banned lands. And these lands, these postage stamps of former territories are, um, well, they're quite horrific. I've been to quite a number and I know that the living conditions are very, very harsh. And there is a culture that has grown out of that uh, when somebody doesn't have access to opportunity uh, to change their lives or easy access to it that, um, you know, you, it, it pulls you down. And then it starts to create this, this environment where uh, women uh, become targets of violence and death. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so this is what the, the inquiry really started to uncover, didn't it? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a, an unpleasant task, but one that had to be done. We had to uh, tell the Canadian public and the international uh, organizations, uh, international experts, people, internationally who had interest in our work, that the uh, vision or the, or the impression that Canada likes to leave internationally is not the truth. Simply not the truth. Mm -hmm. You talk about being quite disturbed when you were in the midst of uh, this truth gathering. Uh, what were some of the stories that resonate the most with you uh, that help us to understand the situation that we're in, and then can also give us insights into how we move forward to start to correct some of these wrongs. You know, there, I, I can't say that there were three individual stories, but there were three sort of general scenarios that uh, really stay with me, and um, they're going to stay with me for a while. The first one uh, was my visit to the penitentiary for women in Edmonton, mm -hmm. and I was moved and I'm still moved by the number of very, very young Indigenous women who are incarcerated and serving federal sentences. A lot of them caught up in the mandatory minimum sentences that the government uh, uh, decided would be in somebody's best interest. 
Uh, these are young girls who, and I call them girls because they're 19, they're 20, they're 21 years old, uh, who are incarcerated and will be for a while. And they're growing up in an institution that uh, is really not there to look after them. Uh, that's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. So uh, the incarcerated women and trying to understand why they were there, how they got there, and how on earth they're going to get out and cope when they leave. Mm -hmm. That's a whole area for me. And it's an area that, uh, because of the lack of time we had to do our work, uh, we couldn't explore any more than just a very, very superficial look. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were able to identify several issues. Uh, the next area that really concerned me was the evidence that we heard about human trafficking and the sex industry and how, uh, uh, spoiler alert, uh, this is really some awful uh, information, that girls as young as nine are being trafficked. They're being taken off the street, abducted, and trafficked. Traffickers do it because they know how to do it. They know nobody's going to come looking for those girls. And if they do, uh, it's just going to be a slap on the wrist. The cost of doing business may be doing six months in jail, even if they're convicted. So it's a... And it's very difficult to get a <laughs> conviction as well. It is. Yeah. Uh, just recently, Ontario has moved ahead and obtained several convictions. But... Uh, it's a horrendous situation. I'm a grandma. I've got uh, right. grandkids, and, and it, w it really concerns me. Uh, by the time a girl is 16 years old, she's considered to be too old. Uh, yeah, I, uh, exactly. Um, <laughs> and traffickers can get girls out of a police jurisdiction in a heartbeat, uh, and they know police don't talk to each other. So they're doing this with a great deal of impunity and immunity. So that's the, the second area. And the third area that really concerns me, again, we only scratched the surface on, was uh, man, what we call man camps. Uh, these uh, large thousand person camps that uh, spring up overnight in the middle of nowhere for resource extraction. And right. the dangers that that presents to not only Indigenous women who work at these man camps, but Indigenous women back home. And uh, how they have to deal with a spouse who's away from home for extended periods of time, uh, for lack of resources in communities. And of course, when these man camps spring up, the cost of living in associated communities just skyrockets. And if you're already barely making ends meet, it makes life all but impossible. So those were three areas that uh, really stay with me and still bother me. So when I think about how do we move forward, there are so many interwoven components in this that go uh, to the heart of uh, the structure of our society, um, our relationship with First Peoples going back to first contact, and then of course the formation of Canada and the introduction of the Indian Act, which definitely was designed to move people, uh, Indigenous people, either onto there or to disappear in mainstream society. And so we have all of these things that have come together um, and put pressure on various levels of, of government right down to leadership within Indigenous communities. How do we now start to untangle that mess? Because it is an interwoven catastrophe. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's, it isn't easy. No. But it is not impossible. And I think that's the perspective we have to take. It's easy to be overwhelmed, but just one step at a time. And I think the first step is a step you've already taken. That's to have an open mind. Mm -hmm. To say, okay, now, now what? What are we going to do about this? Because a lot of people say, no, nope, not interested. Um, let them, whoever they are, deal with the problem. Uh, I think that the first step is saying, what do I or what can I as a Canadian citizen do, a member of this state? First step. Next step is education. The next step is really to understand what has truly happened in Canada because 
uh, our schools have never taught the true history of Canada, even yeah. still. Right. And COVID's no excuse from my perspective. <laughs> right. So we have to learn about what's really happened in our history in this land uh, in order to move forward so that we're not repeating the mistakes. And I think after we have all come to understand and, and be educated about what's really happened, then there's going to be something that resonates with us. And for each individual, it's different. So, for example, uh, in my neighborhood, uh, as a result of talking to my neighbors over the back fence, uh, my neighbors have started to support our local transition house. Mm -hmm. Most of my neighbors didn't know we even had one. Yeah, so it's little things like that. But it's not a, oh, we feel sorry and let's throw more money at the problem. It's let's rebuild together mm -hmm. in a good way. And uh, it can happen. And it is happening across Canada. Well, I agree with you. I think that we cannot just say, oh, well, this government or that level of government, you deal with it. I actually think that it comes down to us as individuals. And so the report, we look at it and we look at all these different uh, layers within society and go, yep, all these things contributed to it. But as you pointed out, I, it's the millions of interactions of individual people that start to change the way in which we treat one another. Mm -hmm. I can't help but think that at the, at the very uh, fundamental uh, foundation of all, of all of that has to be respect for individuals. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. One-on-one -on -one respect. And that respect is based in education, I believe. Uh, in our final report, we had calls for justice that all Canadians could participate in. One of them, for example, is to call out racism, sexism, homophobia, wherever it happens, no, to not be afraid to speak up. Uh, one of, another call for justice for all Canadians is to educate themselves about the true history of Canada, as I've already mentioned. And, you know, uh, our other calls for justice are there uh, to rebuild relationships, to uh, hold governments to account, uh, to vote. For heaven's sakes, vote. Mm -hmm. Every vote matters. You know, it's little things that matter. There was one uh, woman who was giving testimony that is on your website. She was talking about her life and how she wound up at a fairly young age in a city and turned to sex work because she had no other options. There were none. And she said, so when you talk to me about let's ban prostitution, maybe that will help solve the problem. And she said... Okay. I think we need to address poverty, lack of education, lack of access, uh, access to opportunity first. And if we can deal with those, then let's talk about <laughs> what a, when that's your option. Yeah. It's a horrible situation to be in. It is. It is. And, uh, you know, there's so many women and girls to us people, as you say, have no other option because of our history of marginalizing, of being marginalized, of poor education, on reserve edu uh, I don't want to bore you with stats because I can go on for hours, but education on reserve land is funded at 70 cents on the dollar right. for off reserve. So what are you gonna get? And I don't mean to be disrespectful to the fabulous teachers who every day on reserve land give 110% and do it from a good place. Mm -hmm. uh, when you come from a, a location where violence has become normalized, what are you going to do? You have to leave. So you leave your home community and the violence being normalized is a whole other discussion. You have to leave your community and what skills do you come with uh, a second-rate education, uh, in all likelihood trauma from uh, being exposed to violence in your own community, the effects, the intergenerational effects of uh, trauma from the residential schools. What are your options realistically? Uh, they're very limited. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 
you know, you, you run away. I heard this from so many people. You run away from one set of problems at home on your reserve or in your community or your settlement, uh, and you run to a whole new set of problems for which you have no tools to no. cope. Yeah. That access to education is uh, fundamentally important. And the stats that you talk about, I'm aware of. Um, and so for people who are outside of reserve, they don't understand the disparity in education funding and what that means. There was a young man that I uh, interviewed at, uh, on the uh, grounds of the Penticton Indian Band who had been part of an education program. Um, and I said, so what was the greatest thing that you uh, obtained from having, going, having gone through this? And he said, well, self-confidence. Mm -hmm. And I went, well, why is that important? And he said, well, because once you have it, it's like wildfire. You have no idea where it will take you. And isn't this what we want everybody to be empowered with? The ability to go out and seize opportunities that allow themselves to realize their potential. Not the one that we want to impose upon them, but no. their potential. Absolutely. Absolutely. That should be the birthright of every Canadian, Indigenous or not. Yes. And it isn't. No. And as a result, we all lose. Because if you, no matter who you are, don't realize your full potential, then there's a loss to all of society. Absolutely. And it's a non-renewable resource. Yes. This is a conversation that I wish that I could have for about three hours. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we didn't you know, dig into the details of everything about the report, but really I think it is what is the impact of, uh, of having had this inquiry. And this is what gives me hope. Thank you very much for coming in and doing this. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah.